Hey, 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 hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Limitless Show. Today, my guest and I will be talking about how to feel worthy of love and attention. So if that really interests you, then carry on listening. I am so excited to introduce you to my new guest. I've been trying to get him on The Limitless Show for a while now. He has his own channel with three of his other brothers, which are actually his quadruplets. They're so funny. I love them. So I'm so excited for this conversation. So welcome to the Limitless Show, Saban Karma. Thank you so much for having me, Emily. I remember when you still, when you reach out to me, how uh, I just felt so honored to, I love your YouTube channel as well. And just the way you really talk about mindset and limitations. I think it's something so many people can get so much value from and you're doing an amazing job. So I was definitely honored to, to, be, to be here today. No, I appreciate you so much and I appreciate you for being here. So for anyone who does not know what The Limitless Show about is about, The Limitless Show is where I bring a new guest on every single week to my YouTube channel and we talk about a limitation they've had in their life and how they've overcome it in the hopes that if you're struggling with the same thing, what we say in this episode may help you too. So when I was talking to Saban, he said that he wanted to talk about how he used to feel that he wasn't worthy of love and attention. So for my first question, I wanna ask you, Saban, why did you not feel worthy of love and attention? Yeah, uh, great question. So I'm an identical quadruplet, right? Which is, as an identical quadruplet boy, it's a one in 600 million chance of birth, I believe. But while the statistic may be extraordinary and many assume that our life was perfect as a result, this couldn't be be further from the truth. I mean, imagine it may sound great and appear great to get tons of stares and attention and comments. We were so popular in elementary school, but at the same time when we had to wear the same colors to elementary school every single day so people can tell us apart, people referred to us by our last name, karma. And think about what that does to a child. It causes you to internalize the belief that you're not worthy of love and attention, that your individual and authentic self within is not worthy. And this caused us to strive to stand out amongst one another because we thought that was the only way we would gain individual significance and recognition. I'll give you a couple examples. One, we had obsessive competition and discipline. We were up at 3.30 in the morning, we skated for eight hours a day one summer, so we played ice hockey, it was our favorite sport. And so we did a couple of these things. One, we didn't even eat junk food for three years straight, three years straight. And while this discipline may be admirable, the motivation behind it was destructive. Was destructive. It was the fear that we wouldn't be individually loved or recognized. The second one was extreme harsh judgment of ourselves and each other, of ourselves and that we never let ourselves be happy in the moment because we always thought that the next level of hockey that we hadn't gotten to yet was the only way that we would feel worthy of a love and attention. We remember dreaming of making the National Hockey League, but the dream was that when we finally got that recognition, I would finally feel worthy. And I realize now how much of a problem that is. And the third one, the worst for me, was the appearance of perfection. I always, for me, put on a front and I always acted like I had it figured out in the moment. And I think, I don't know, the problem with that is that I'm screaming that I am not enough in these moments, that I'm not enough inherently, but I have to be perfect to be enough. And so the more we stroke, we did these actions, the more we simultaneously reinforce that we're not enough inherently. And what's funny about deep rooted insecurities is that when hockey went away, the insecurities didn't go away. They simply took on new form. I remember in my gap year between high school and college, I, and this is something I didn't think I would ever share, but I, First, I bought likes and followers on Instagram to appear to have a better ratio. Second, I lied about when I lost my virginity to all my brothers because I wanted to stand out from them and gain that kind of recognition and be better than them. And then when we got to our freshman year of college, the competition went from hockey to who can be with the most girls as a way to determine our self-worth. The judgments went from the judgments went from hockey to more of like who could be the most we had this thing where we called stepping into fear, which is like a good thing. Like you step into things that make you uncomfortable. But we used to have a chat called the vulnerability chat where people would post when they would do something that was step into fear. And 
all the other brothers, rather than feeling happy for him, would actually get a lot of anxiety because we felt like we weren't good enough if we weren't doing those things. And so what I've realized that so many of my insecurities that were so obvious in childhood, if you don't go within and resolve them, <clears throat> they just take on new and subtler forms. And so all of this reinforced a deep-rooted belief that my real individual self within was not worthy of love or attention. I really hear you. And I want to see if I get this correct, because I've been studying your channel, obviously. So you used to go into, when you were in elementary school, you had to wear a particular colour so people would actually know who you are. So yes. Saban, you were scarlet. Lennon yes. was lime green. Yep. Nolan was navy blue. Yep. And Mark was multicoloured, whatever anyone else didn't wear. That in its whole, having to wear clothes to actually be recognized for who you are as a human yes. being, to yes. be an, in, an individual, for people to actually make an effort to know who you are. I, I can see how that can leave a bit of trauma in your life. But what I can hear from what you're saying right now, prove me if I'm wrong, the two things that really was the catalyst and the problem that stemmed from not feeling being able to have love and affection, um, it sounds to me it was like perfection was one of them and not being able to be unique because you were a quadruplet and no one really saw your uniqueness. And I'm definitely going to get into these later in the episode of how you got over these. But for me, what I really want to ask you is you said something really interesting when you were explaining all of this to me before the episode. And you said because you didn't feel worthy of love and affection, you came across to the world as resist me, I'm not worthy of your love and attention. What does yeah. that mean? What was yeah. resist me? How did you show up in the world? Great, great. So I think, <clears throat> great question, by the way, I think resist me. So first, I'm under the belief that we all send out broadcast messages, messages to the entire world, not through our voice or through necessarily our body language, but through our subtlest signs that tell everyone exactly how to treat us. I truly believe it's an intuitive thing. And what's interesting is I was on uh, the phone a couple of weeks ago with an emotion healing coach, an intuitive healing coach. And she, from my subconscious, she detected, and this, sound, this is not, science has not backed this stuff up yet, but she said, resist me. Your broadcast messages resist me. And that made so much sense because resist me if you finish that sentence. That's I am not, because I am not worthy of love and attention. If I was worthy of those things, then you wouldn't resist me, but resist me because I don't deserve your love and attention. And so that makes so much sense that because of my belief within, that's what I broadcasted without. And so that show, I showed up in the world. And I think so many men especially do this from this place of unworthiness as prove people and myself wrong. I'm going to, out of this pain, I'm going to prove to everyone that I'm going to get good enough, smart enough, attractive enough, or make the NHL. And then finally, everyone will recognize me as an individual. And while this may be a great asset externally, as it got me to some of the highest levels of youth hockey, it was a huge detriment internally in that it reinforced my unworthiness and it kept me dependent on others for validation. I was obsessed with what everyone thought. And that's what all perfectionism is. It's when literally you let your actions be determined in the views and the eyes of everyone else and not yourself. And so, yeah, and so I especially had to prove to myself that I was enough as well. And that's where all the delaying happiness came in. I would achieve something and be like, feel like enough for this amount of time. And then that would quickly go away and I still wouldn't feel like myself. So I would say that's probably the way I, I showed up in the world. What I want to ask you is how else do people show up when they don't feel like they deserve love and affection because i was thinking there's definitely been a long time in my life through when i was going through depression and anxiety that i really didn't feel worthy of love and attention and what i would do is self-sabotage what else do you think people do when they feel that they're not worthy of love and attention yeah so uh, the two main ones one i think is the prover the other one what a lot of people do also and you wouldn't think this is the pleaser the people that are people pleasers also feel that they have to put everyone's happiness first because they aren't truly worth a love or attention. And that's rooted in unworthiness. What I think is interesting is that, I'll give an example, me and my ex-girlfriend, I was the prover, she was the pleaser. We seem like we're on opposite ends of the spectrum, but we have the same underlying root of unworthiness. And I think that like attracts like, so we were very attracted to each other for that reason. So I would say those are the main two. There's so many nuances 
Now, what I like to do when people are not sure if they're worthy or why they feel unworthy is ask them this. I say, do you feel like enough? And if they say yes, which some people do, if they say no, they know they're not enough, they can find out why. If they say yes, I say, why do you think they're enough? And if they say anything but nothing, I just am. Whatever they say is a, one reason of their, is one of many reasons of their unworthiness. So if they say, I'm enough, are you enough? Yes. Why? Because I make a lot of money. Well, now we know that you have an attachment to money in which you're depending on your happiness for it. Just saying you're not worthy within unless you have an external thing. And I had this line in one of my YouTube videos that holds true here that what well, goals are fine when we expect external goals to fill internal holes. All we do is come up empty and we lose the opportunity to become truly whole within. And so if someone answers anything but nothing, I just am or I am inherently worthy and infinite because of a hu I'm a human being, which is something I've just come to realize recently, you have an attachment to something that's causing you to show up in the world of a way that's reinforcing your unworthiness. So what I really want to do for this next part of the episode is go through these reasons why people feel like they're not worthy of love and attention. Because once you know why something, you can always overcome it, but you can't overcome something if you don't know why there's a problem in the first place. So first of all, I want to start with you and your, you know, your issues per se, um, of why you didn't feel um, worthy of love and attention. And the th first one I want to go through is being a quadruplet. Because I myself, I have two older brothers. And I think yeah. with any siblings, you feel competitive, or you feel like, why am I not good as, as them? I have two older brothers, and they are very, very clever. And I was always jealous of that. And I always wanted to be more clever. When I got my exam results, I always wanted to do better. Like, it, there is a competitiveness, but there must be even more of a competitiveness when they're yeah. quadruplets. Not just siblings, but quadruplets. How yeah. did you overcome this kind of, you know, mindset? Um, and how did you feel more worthy and unique within your quadruplet? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, to be honest, it was something that really didn't start until a couple of years ago, maybe even in quarantine, in that I think I was so busy competing with my brothers that I never got to understand who they were. If you never understand who someone else is because you're so busy competing to win their approval, you're not getting to know them as individuals. Once you get to know someone so, so deeply, I truly believe that you get to a point with someone where it's incomparable, where you literally can't make comparisons because they have such a radically different life experience than you. And I don't think we really got to know each other because we were so busy trying to win each other's approval and going off in security until we made a bold decision to not just do individual therapy, but to do therapy as quadruplets. We, have a, we still have a therapist for the last six months who all four of us sit down here every Thursday, actually today in a couple hours, and we all talked to her. And I just remember the first session in March was filled with so much tension in the air, so many years and years of tension that have been built since we all separated and went to different colleges. But over time, we've gained more of a mutual understanding for each other and you start to move to a place of acceptance. And we felt the space now in therapy, a safe space to say what bothered us and when it bothered us. And we were able to actually have a real conversation about that. And then we also, when we finally started going deep within, and I can get deeper into some of these stories about how I did this personally, when I started to resolve some of my own insecurities, some of these own individual insecurities that I had within, as I resolved that, and as I felt the space and got more in touch with my emotions to say what bothered me, I think a combination of those two things led me to more of a place of acceptance and love with myself and my brothers, because I think the reflection of you is the reflection of how you see everyone else. And yeah, it's just a place of total love and acceptance rather than competition and judgment. It's just, it was just a shift. It's not a fast one, but it, over time it's, it's, and it's not perfect, of course, but it's continual progress. I think it's seeing your siblings as actual human beings and not just your siblings. Like they are their own person and you need to get to know them as if they were a friend and not related to you and really yeah. get to know them and make the effort that you would make an effort with someone who wasn't your family. Because I think yeah. you make more effort with people who aren't your family. So it's making them know who they are. Um, I definitely feel at the moment, I don't know who my brother is and he doesn't know as much who I am. Um, but if we sat down and actually got to know each other as people rather than just siblings and all these like kind of thoughts behind it because especially with family your family see you mostly who you were like five years ago 
yes at, with like all the problems like my brother sees me as like a spoiled brat my brother sees me as like this annoyance when actually i've grown so much in the last year let alone the five and yeah. you've got to realize that you have them perceptions of your siblings as well like i see him in some negative lights as well when actually he isn't that negative light that i need to see him in that but yeah that's definitely a way to get you know closer with your siblings as well yeah. and it's hard it's hard it makes it hard to be i felt for so long that it was so hard to be myself around my brothers and my brothers would say yeah they told me the same thing as you like you wouldn't you weren't really here with us saving why are you so on it and so passionate around other people but you're not that around us and it's because it's the last i think <laughs> for me personally like me becoming a good person the last person I became a good person for was my was my family because they see me through that lens I didn't make my brothers feel heard growing up and so they started shutting down within when I would talk and I would sense that and I internalized hey I'm not allowed to be myself in front of them I'm not allowed to share my passions and so I would do it in front of other people because I didn't have a whole childhood history of pain and trauma with them but you have that with your family and so if you can overcome a lot of your family issues it's a, such a great foundation for the rest of the world I do think that yeah, I'm really interested to know whose idea was it to go to group therapy? Yeah, that's a great question. I think I had done individual therapy for a year or two at the University of Notre Dame. I think it was probably my mom's idea. She's a, she's a hero. She said, you guys should consider doing this. And we've all dabbled with therapy individually in the past. And we were in a really tough situation, which I can, I'll get into more uh, in the beginning of quarantine. Our whole house felt like it was falling apart and my whole life was falling apart. And it was just in that moment of suffering in that valley we knew like my mom and we all knew like i think because we were suffering so much we were open to that idea when we may have shut it down earlier and mm. so we just took it and ran with it and luckily got an incredible incredible therapist who's worked with triplets actually so she has background even in multiples and it's been a long process but such a worthwhile one also another thing that comes with this love and attention when it comes to your siblings and feeling like a comparison there you've got to realize that everyone is their own person and the way you compare yourself to everyone else and the way you compare to yourself to your family like you've just got to realize in a whole you are a unique person no one is you and your journey is yours so you are worthy of love and attention comparison doesn't even come into it like you don't need to compare yourself to anyone the only person who you should compare yourself to is yourself is your yeah. past self is your yesterday self is your 10 seconds ago self and i think if people stop comparing themselves as much to other people and realize what they're doing with their life and the way they're living is worthy and who they are is worthy of love and attention um, because I think a lot of things and a lot of issues come from comparison, especially with social media and everything like that. I, I totally agree with that. And I think for me as a quadruplet, I do truly believe that I could, if I can find a way out of it from going so to the opposite end of the spectrum, being literally told probably more than anyone that I was not worthy as an individual, getting that reinforced because of my unique life. And if I can climb out of that, I think I want to help people. Like I, I do believe that that pain was also a seed for a calling for me to want to help so many people do the same because these insecurities that I'm discussing, you know this, they're magnified because I'm a quadruple, but they're not uncommon by any means. These are widespread problems, competition, judgment, all not thinking you're worthy. All of these are common problems that I really want to help the world with. I think that is when people go through a hard time, they realize that they want to help with other people because they don't want anyone to feel like they felt. That's definitely exactly. why I started my channel because I don't want anyone to feel as depressed and lonely as I felt. And that's why I'm here talking to you and talking to all these new amazing people. So the next thing I want to get into is perfectionism, not feeling worthy of love and attention because of perfectionism. Explain that a bit more to me. Okay. Yeah, um, there's no such thing as perfect, right? The perfection, I believe, is in the reflection. Is The perfect is in the beauty of being imperfect. But so many times when you think you actually have to be perfect, and our society doesn't help this, every time you think you have to be perfect, every time you make that post on social media of you looking as perfect as possible, that comes because you think your flaws aren't worth of showing to the world. And guess what that also does? When everybody sees that, they start comparing their imperfect selves to your per seemingly perfect self. And so from a place of insecurity, you try to appear perfect on social media. Now the people who see that, they feel insecure. Now they're gonna start trying to be perfect on social media and you just spread because this kind of negativity and suffering, it's infectious because we're all so connected for better or for worse. And so when you spread that and you mask 
your unworthiness by trying to appear perfect, which all you do is you feel more unworthy because you're literally bearing it down and you cause everyone else around you to feel worthy. And so if you're not gonna do it for yourself, and I think you should, if you're ever gonna have, wanna have a real impact on the world, impact people on a soul level, you have to, you have to heal yourself. That's something I've just come to realize because you can help people externally with the numbers and stuff, but if you're not healed, you're never really gonna help them on the deepest levels because you're never gonna be able to get out of your own way. And I think there's such a magical thing to vulnerability. The people I connect to most are the people who are vulnerable because I can see myself in them. If I see this perfect person, I don't see myself in them. I don't empathize, I don't relate. But when someone is on camera crying or just being vulnerable or just opening up, that does something for me and it does something for other people as well. But when it comes to perfectionism and not feeling worthy of love, how do you overcome this? How do you realize that you don't need to be perfect? Uh, are you talking about me personally or are you talking about just in general? You personally, go for you. You know the best yeah. thing about you. I truly believe that I have this saying that no, let's say jerk, goes, goes to a vacation on Hawaii and then comes back being a great person because there's something about suffering that forces us to change if we let it. I'll give you an example. So my freshman year of college, I was at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. I was a, I don't know how else to say it, except a player. I was chasing after girl, after girl, after girl. I was trying to maintain the 4.0 GPA while partying six nights a week, perfect ideal work hard, play hard college image so everybody would look up to me. And although it seemed like I had it all, I was rotting, absolutely rotting on the inside. That did not change until my second semester, my freshman year at the University of Illinois, in that I still remember this so vividly. I was missing my brothers quite a bit because we had a great winter break, but, and I knew something was missing, but I still was chasing the fraternity life. I remember I went out every night for like the first month, every single night I was out drinking. And I got a bid, which is like an acceptance award to join two different fraternities. The first fraternity, when my oldest brother, non-quadruplet, was visiting me at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, we were at a bar on a Saturday morning, just to give you an idea of where I was. I got a text from the president. He said, after further consideration, we don't think you'd be a good fit for our house. I was, I, 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 was, I felt horrible. I was like, this was, I was gonna join this fraternity. They were called ATO and I wasn't gonna join the other one. This is the one I really wanted, the one I felt connected to or whatever that meant, uh, what I thought that meant at the, at the time. But I said, you know what? I'll just join Fiji, which is the other fraternity. Before you know it, a couple weeks in, I have a theory behind this, wh why this happened, but I'll let you know what happened first. I specifically remember, just to show who I was, I invited three different girls to this bar crawl date event. Two, not three at once, but one at a time. Two couldn't make it. So I invited a third girl that I had met the weekend before of my older brother when the ATO thing happened. And I didn't know her that well. I'd met her once. She showed up late. She didn't come to the pregame. She came to the bar. And she, we gave each other a hug. We started talking. She went to the bathroom. And about 10 minutes after arrival, I never saw her again. So she was gone. I was a very, very upset. A lot of my unworthiness started to kick in. And what did I do? Instead of going within and observing those feelings, I started drinking a little bit more and more and more. Now, what I remember next is a little bit hazy, but I know enough to know what I'm about to tell you. I remember flash forward, I'm at another bar. Well, back up a second. I actually made a decision that I'm going to go talk, something I normally didn't do, go talk to every single girl in the bar. I'm going to prove to myself that I can do this. Flash forward, I'm at a different bar. It's called Red Lion. I'll never forget. And I'm talking to this girl. Now, I'm not doing anything inappropriate. I'm just touching her on the shoulder and stuff and we're interacting. I know Because I, I know I have a very good heart. You'll see why I'm saying this in a second. I get a tap from behind me on my shoulder. I turn around. It's the, like one, the president or vice president of Fiji. He says, hey, dude, you need to calm down. What do you, like, you're being aggressive. I'm like, I was confused. I'm like, what do you mean? Uh, and what I found out was that that girl had a date with her. But I was just talking to her. It wasn't like I was doing something. I wasn't supposed to be. And so I said, okay, I backed off. I went and hung out with the guys for the rest of the night. Then three days later, we have a pledge meeting. I couldn't make it because I think I had an econ midterm, but the pledge masters, the people who take care of the pledges, which I was when you join a fraternity. I remember so vividly, they asked me to come after. 
I didn't know why. I remember right after the meeting, the three of them walked me all the way out. They stood me right outside the fraternity house. And then they started talking. And I started getting this intuitive feeling that something was wrong. And then they said a couple words. Your behavior was inappropriate on Friday night, which was the bar crawl, with fraternity values. And then they said, you're bonged from the fraternity. And just like that, feelings of anxiety, of overwhelm, of pain flooded my body so quickly. It's so hard to even describe how I felt in that moment, but I was so overwhelmed while putting on a confident front in front of them like it was all too common for me. I remember shaking each of their hands saying, thank you for the opportunity. But as I turned around, I remember just tears going down my face. I called my mom. I thought the reasons were because I wasn't gonna be able to be with as many girls or I wouldn't have friends. But now that I look back, were those even my friends in the first place? But I most of all feared being lonely. I felt alone for the first time in my life. But there's something beautiful that happens in that suffering. You're forced to confront yourself. You're forced to look at yourself in the mirror. And I realized that the person that I had been, I, I was drifting like a leaf in the wind through status quo, through popularity, because I had no vision for my future ever since I quit hockey. I was still hurt by that and this unworthiness. And I was, they were just manifesting in new forms. And so I made a bold decision in that space that I was never gonna be like that again. And what's crazy is once you set an intention on something, opportunities start happening. I got into meditation, but first my dad told me he was reading this book called Untethered Soul. I don't know if you've heard of it by Michael Singer. It was the first time that I heard this statement. The inner voice in your head, you may think it's you, but it's actually not you. I never heard that before. I'd always believed the dialogue in my head, but they walked us, that book walked me through a little experiment. It said, start shouting, hello, hello in your head. And you realize that you're the one who hears that voice. But again, just because I had intellectual understanding didn't mean I knew how to embody that. But that's where meditation came in. Meditation was literally the embodiment as you brought yourself back to the breath and passively and non-judgmentally observe every thought and feeling that came up, you created a gap between who you really were and your thoughts. And over time, that creation allowed me to challenge all of the BS narratives that I've been telling myself about my unworthiness. It also caused me to transfer to the University of Notre Dame. So there was a little bit of that proved people wrong, but it's, this is what's led to the foundation for a over two year process now of me constantly challenging not just the world around me and its rules, but also everything that comes up in here. And so it's that process of challenging, of reflection, of questioning. And later on, yeah, that just led me to a very specific system that I only discovered recently that's helped me have a very systematic way to take myself through a challenging process of every old belief I've had and a way to reprogram all those beliefs and repeat those in my mind until I start to believe them. But like I said, it's only in that suffering. If I didn't suffer, I think looking back, I literally tell everyone this because it's so true. If I ever saw that girl again, or I ever saw those pledge masters again, I would truly give them a hug and say, thank you so much. I don't know where I would be if you didn't do what you did. And I think that is what's so beautiful about suffering. If you let it transform you by confronting yourself within and realizing that you're not the person you need to be. Through suffering, you really learn a lot about yourself. Um, there's definitely a lot of friends that I've lost along the way who have caused me pain, but through that pain, I've learned so much. I've learned about my values and my priorities and who I am. And for that, I'm grateful to those people. You can always learn something from someone, even if it's something negative or comes from a negative source, making it positive. But you can always learn something from someone. I love what you say about um, the mind chatter in your head as well. It's, it's not your own voice. You're not in control and you're not responsible for the first thought in your head but you are responsible for that next thought and that next action yes. because sometimes things just pop up in our heads and I'm like, why the hell did I just think that? Or what, what a weird thought. And it's just not you. And it's crazy because a lot of people until they're told that voice is not you, they believe it. They believe every negative thing said in their head. They believe every negative thing about other people, the world themselves. And you need to realize that actually that voice inside my head is not me. And also I can control that voice inside my head through things like meditation, affirmations, re like 
training and reprogramming the subconscious so that when you're having these thoughts that just pop up in your head, they're more likely to be positive. I came across this crazy, crazy fact that we have 60 to 80,000 thoughts every single day and 80% of them are negative. Yes, I you that. You need to retrain them. You need to meditate and, you know, all these things. So, yeah, definitely for perfectionism and being a perfectionist and, you know, in relation to how to feel more worthy of love and attention, don't listen to the voice in your head. Reprogram yes. it, change it, work on it. And it's, it's a lifetime thing. It you is. don't do it for a month or a year and then, bam, you're cured. No and way, because it, it happened in childhood, right? In childhood... You didn't have the power to control these, so you believed them. And that was the time where your brain was literally forming. So these thoughts are not just, if you have thoughts now that are negative, your brain's mostly developed. And so they're much easier to let go of. But when it happens, as your brain's forming, the neural pathways literally become ingrained within the growth of your brain. That's why I really believe it takes years and years and years to undo this. But it's by far the most worthy process because you spend all of your time in your life with yourself. Why would you not learn to confront yourself, know yourself, accept yourself, love yourself? What a weight. I feel like my life's going to be wasted if I spend it from that internal place of unworthiness. And one thing I've come to realize, my mindset matters so much. It's really something I haven't come to realize till lately. I was the king of habit in action, getting up at 3.30 a.m. every day, not eating junk food for three years. And I even had a coach who played in the National Hockey League say, you, you work harder than anybody I know, yet I couldn't attain any level of success in hockey that I truly wanted to or fulfillment because I wouldn't let myself be happy. And I think the thing that was missing for me was mindset. I thought self-love was arrogant and mindset was BS. That doesn't affect you. But I'll give you, I just want to give you one quick example. And it's a little harder to do without a partner. But I was giving a talk that I, I told you about a couple days ago. And I had a 13-year-old girl, my cousin, come up for this example. For a reason. She has very little strength. And I had her hold her arm out like this. And I started to push down on the arm. And I said, resist my arm. And I did. And I said, now I want you to think positive thoughts in your head over and over. I am worthy. I am strong. I am powerful. I started, she started saying those. I was pushing hard as I could. She's half my weight, if not less. I think she's less than eight. She's 80 pounds. I'm about 190, 180. Um, and she was resisting it. So, and she's 13 years old. And then I had her say negative thoughts. I'm a loser. I'll never be anybody. I'm weak. I'm fragile. And just within a half a second to a second, it started going down her, her arm. And I was barely pushing. And what that made me realize is that thoughts, your mind and body are so connected that thoughts have an instantaneous impact on your body. And when you realize that, that inspired me to never want to let negative thoughts just go over and over and over again in my head. Why would I not challenge all of them if they're literally making me weaker? And when people say beliefs become reality, I think that's all the proof that I needed to finally get that bullet. Hmm. Thoughts do become things. Thoughts yes. really do become things. And especially with that, like, you know, the pressure thing, <laughs> You can do this, like, I used to do it while running, like, my knee would start to ache and I'd actually start thinking, no, I'm strong, I have strength. And it pushes you further even more um, because you believe it in yourself. Our life is all perspective. And if you have a positive perspective, your life's going to be more positive. But yeah, no, I love that. And I love that example. The next thing I want to ask you is for people who feel unworthy of love and attention and self-sabotage, how would you overcome that? So going within is by far the first step. Like I said earlier, external goals don't fill internal holes. You have to go deep inside of yourself and really begin to challenge the narratives and things that come up and not look for external things to fill them because I like to use this analogy that I found to be really powerful. Let's say you have a root problem of unworthiness and it manifests in different forms. I like to compare that root to the root of a mushroom. It's below the surface. You don't see it in the outside world, but it's there and it affects you. And so there's also the mushroom that's on the surface. Let's say that was my hockey. When hockey ended or I achieved a certain level in hockey that I thought would make me feel better, all I did was chop that mushroom off at the surface and it felt great. My unworthiness might be gone. I finally did it. But in just a little amount of time, <laughs> that came absolutely flooding back. 
And so what we need to do is get to the root and literally pull that root out. And that starts from a deep discernment process of going within. And I'm actually creating that I talked about in my last video, a document that's all about this because finding your true self, everyone talks about, you know, find your true self, be yourself, don't care what others think. But I wanted to come up with a system by which people can have specific actions that they can take to become their most authentic and truest self. So I, don't, I haven't found that out there. And I think the first step is self-confrontation. Self-confrontation means that the people that feel unworthy of love and attention need to stop doing the things that are making them feel that way. They need to isolate themselves from everything and everyone. The ways that I was unworthy, the ways I would mask it was by looking to things and people to fill those things. And so even for a brief period of time, it's important to isolate yourself from all of those. So I usually recommend stop social media. I stopped social media for two years. I'm not saying social media is inherently bad. I'm on it now. I stopped for two years. It fixed a lot of my unworthiness problems. I was off it. I wasn't dependent on how many likes I got. I wasn't buying any likes. Um, so I took some time off because I, I'm an extremist. And then I came back to the middle ground. I use it in moderation. Now I would say set a time limit for social media. Don't obsessively check your feed. I say use social media for its media purposes. It has some great uses, connections, like-minded people. But when you're checking your feed, which is carefully curated by computer engineers and scientists to keep you on there as much as possible and to keep you unworthy, because only in a state of unworthiness will you keep consuming, will you keep buying. They want to keep you there. And so you really need to have a rigorous system put in place. And I really talk about this in my document about how to do this because that will be one way you can force yourself to confront yourself. The second one, I would say, that's just one example. I won't go into all of them, but the second thing after that is you wanna to get to know yourself. You wanna to get to know yourself. There's certain exercises, like beginning to know your values, beginning to tell yourself that you're enough so you learn to accept yourself. I literally do this exercise where it's not in this room, but in almost every other room. I've been doing this for months. I just started writing, I am enough, everywhere on my mirrors in my phone i have reminders it's on my lock screen it's on my home screen it's on my fridge you'll be surprised at how much of a difference even that little thing can make and so at, and there's certain exercises where i think one of the reasons i was so drawn to popularity and the status quo is because i just didn't know who i was i didn't know what i valued and there was a very specific exercise and it's called the origin story exercise where you go back to your deepest pains and joys in childhood. And you think about those stories because in those moments are usually where your values that are hold deep into your soul, those values you hold so deeply, they exist right in those moments. And so from doing this exercise, I realized I value authenticity. Why? I value bold authenticity actually. Why? Because I was the exact opposite growing up and I know what that gap is like between who you present to the world and who you how you actually feel that's suffering in that gap i value unconditional human connection because my brothers and i literally shared a womb together even though we competed in stuff we were so interconnected and still are and every time i see my brothers after months being apart from them in college those feelings that i get of joy and bliss and connection are things that i never felt and i value things like self transformation and getting the absolute most out of life because of moments in my childhood as well. And so I really think confronting yourself was the first step, getting to know yourself was the second. And then specific exercises where the affirmations come in and the self-love exercises, the accepting yourself and loving yourself. And I think that's how you can break out of unworthiness of love and attention. I do, it's a long process. You have to keep going back through it. It's not like you just go up and you're done, but I, this is, what I have found to be the best way to work for me. Yeah, I think that is the main thing for any problem you have in your life. You really need to know the root of it. You need to know what the root problem is so you can kind of, like you can work back to work forwards. A lot of people say when you're finding a partner, you search for what you got as a child or what you didn't get as a child. So mm -hmm. if your mom gave you loads of affection, you're searching for that. Or mm -hmm. if you didn't get loads of affection, you're searching for that. And that kind of sounds what it sounds what it's like for like worthiness and attention as well. Like you're searching for what you didn't get, or you want bold. You like bold authenticity because that's what you didn't have. Yes. Um, but it's 
it's really interesting because I think journals are great. Definitely. If you really want to go inside or if you need someone to talk to, go to like a therapist or like a counselor or a life coach. Um, but yeah. it is, that's the hard thing. It's going back to your childhood traumas is getting uncomfortable. And that's why people don't do it because it is uncomfortable. Like it's not nice. It's not nice. It's easier just to sit in this like world that you're living rather than be uncomfortable to get better. Yes. And continually do things for me. Even this last semester before COVID hit, I was living what I call the fast life. I was always doing things. I always had to be busy. And that's why I'm so set. The first step, and you'll be surprised how many people have a hard time doing this, is just stop. Stop doing, start being, start doing nothing. Start sitting with yourself. That is so deeply uncomfortable, especially the longer you, I've been avoiding it for 22 years. And so to just sit with myself and watch what comes up, deeply uncomfortable. But there's a thing where things get worse when you want to change before they get better. And you, you said it great as like people change. People are very uncomfortable and that's exactly what holds them back. But I want to serve as inspiration for people to be motivated to do that, not just know what to do. I can't, I, I can't tell you how many times I simply knew the right things and I just could not do them. I've I've known the knowledge of how to be better and I just could not do it. And so I really want to help people be able to do, to actually be able to go within and confront themselves because it's a really hard process. And to me, like prove me if I'm wrong, out of your brothers, it seems like you did have one of the hardest times to really confrontate yourself and your older self. Because I think in your last video, your brothers were saying that they sat you down and said they found it hard to talk to you out of everyone. You were the hardest to talk to. You were the hardest to get yeah. to. It sounds like you had a lot of barriers and a lot of walls um, out of the four of you. I did. I did. And I masked it all in the appearance of perfection. I would always get defensive. I couldn't take criticism. I'd always think I was right. That comes from insecurity, but I couldn't admit that for so long. But I think that's why they had such a hard time reaching me. But now I literally value so strongly the opposite. That's my gift that I had that because I know that even though I would never show that to them or anyone for the longest time, I've always known because I've always been with myself how deeply wounding and how much that hurts on the inside. And my wish for so many people, when I see people put on an appearance of perfection, it gives me such a bad stomach feeling because I know exactly what they're feeling on the inside because it's exactly how I felt. And mm -hmm. I struggled a lot and so did a lot. Of, my brothers all struggled in very different ways. It's hard to compare them, right? But I think uh, I did struggle a lot with this perfection thing more than any of them. Um, mm -hmm. But that also gives me the tools because I've worked so hard to get out of that and will continue to for the rest of my life to want to help people do the exact same thing. Yeah, I think another thing that comes with perfectionism as well, like you can try and be perfect and you might even reach your idea of perfect, yeah. but there are so many successful people, so many people with like loads <laughs> of women on their arms, so many people with like massive houses, mansions, swimming pools, indoor and outdoors, but they're still unhappy. And it's all down to mindset. It's all down to mindset. And if you can't be grateful for what you have at the moment, even if you want to be perfect, even if you reach that idea of perfectionism, you're not going to be happy. You're going to want the next thing because you're not happy yeah. inside. You're going to right. really want the next thing because you are empty inside. So you think, oh, that next thing will give me that wholeness when actually it's you yourself. You need to give that wholeness. You need to give it to yourself. Yeah. It's, it's, like a, it's like a drug, honestly. You need more of a fix to be happy. And one thing I found from a book I read that this, this comes up in relationships. You, a lot of people do this with, obviously you said with loads of women and with massive houses, but in a relationship, you look for someone to fill that hole and you think they do temporarily, but then all of your insecurities come flooding back, probably more magnified than before, like a drug does, it comes back harder and you need more of it. But what do most people do? They play the victim at that point. They think something's wrong with their partner instead of what's wrong with themselves. So constantly, we're, so many people are constantly operating at a state of consciousness where they're looking to the outside world to fill something within. And I, I really have tried so hard for myself to break free of that. And I want to, ah, I just, I just get so frustrated about this because people literally think it's going to fit. They're literally convinced. And I still fall for this sometimes. You're literally convinced if I just made it big or I had this opportunity or I had this partner, then I'd be happy. And people do that their entire lives. And the fin like you said, that finish line where you think is perfection or worthiness, it always just moves. And it always just moves out of your reach. Why? 
guess what? What is the best way to get humans constantly striving and surviving? By giving them a false delusion of happiness if they attain those things. That is the best motivator because all humans want to be happy. And so we have to transcend our own evolutionary programming because we're able to survive now, the majority of us. Now we're just protecting our own psyche. Now we're not protecting our, our survival at this point. What I want to ask you now is, have you got any other piece of advice for people who feel like they're unworthy of love and attention? What would you say to them? What other pieces of advice, what things have you done that helped you? Yeah, I'll give you some specifics. So I've been taking some courses and programs through a platform called Mind Valley, which I absolutely love. And I was taking this speaking course, which I thought was going to make me a better speaker, but it did so much more for me than that. And it also, I read another book, and this is a combination of those things. And so her name is Lisa Nichols. She's very famous, African-American woman. She's been on Oprah. She had a time where she was in such an abusive relationship that she was choked. She was losing her kids. She had no money. The doctor provided her Prozac. First said she was clinically depressed. She said, give me 30 days before you give me this. And the doctor said, okay. She did this one thing every morning. She came back and the doctor said, what happened? You're totally cured. You don't need Prozac. And how can I share this with other people? And she shared this amazing exercise that I've been doing every single day, even though I've been done with the program for a while since she gave it. Look yourself right in the mirror and tell yourself seven things that you're proud of yourself for, seven things you forgive yourself for. So you do it like this, Sabin, I am proud of you for X, seven things. And you say, Sabin, I am proud of you every time, seven times. Sabin, I forgive you for, and Sabin, I commit to you that. And what I realized is that the reason I knew I had unworthiness so bad is because the things I was proud of myself for were so hard to come up. It was so hard to come up with seven things and so easy to come up with seven things to forgive myself for. And over time though, what's funny is that that completely reversed. The proud at this point is so easy for me and the forgiveness is actually getting harder and harder for me. So that's just one of many self love exercises. Putting I am enough up all over my, the mirrors is super important. Doing something like therapy to go deep into an understanding of your problems is so important. And then, like I said, challenging and letting go of those beliefs that don't serve you through meditation, through realizing that voice isn't you. All these things combined over a period of time give you that chance to come out of that unworthiness. Like I said, this is a lot, but it's not an easy process, but it's such a worthwhile one. And it's the one you're going to keep coming back to over and over again. But I want to show up in the world loving myself first. And so I always do these things in the morning before I enter the world. And I usually do them at night before I go to sleep as well. Because if you don't do them, then you're going to the world and needing something from the world to fill you up. And you just give off such a different energy that resist me energy to the world. And then you don't attract the things you want. Or even if you do, you're like you said, Tony Robbins, who I love, like you do, says success without fulfillment is the greatest tragedy. And Robin Williams comes to mind. It's those kind of things that happen when you don't have this wholeness within. It's, it's truly tragic, truly something that I don't, I don't ever want to have to feel that, to have everything and feel horrible and empty on the inside. I would definitely say the first step to overcoming unworthiness or not feeling like you're worth of love and acceptance or attention is finding love for yourself. I think that's the main root problem of a lot of things. You need to learn how to love yourself because like we've been saying, if you don't love yourself, you're going to be searching it from everyone else for the rest of your life. You're always going to be wanting it from somewhere else, someone else or somewhere else. But if you have it within yourself, there's like this unlimited amount of self-love and you don't need it from anyone else because you know you are worthy and it's practices like you say affirmations it's practices like forgiving yourself it's practices like there's so many um things you can do to practice self-love but i think that's the first thing you need to figure out is how to love yourself because when i didn't love myself i wouldn't accept it from anyone else even if it was there there were people who loved me I just didn't accept it. It's not that I wasn't worthy of it, like I thought. It's that I didn't accept it because I didn't think I was deserving of it. But once yeah. you feel deserving of it, you will realize that so many people do love you. They appreciate you. They value you. But you have to do that first. Yes. And the world reflects to you just not what you want in life. The world gives you, I believe, 
or the universe gives you what you are. And so if you think, if you give out the energy of I don't love myself, you're never going to see the love and you're not, anything you get, you're not going to see. But as soon as you start to believe it, the world starts to believe it. You start to see all the people that actually love you and more people start to love you than ever before. And that's because you, you simply love yourself because the inner and outer world are literally mirrors of each other in my opinion beliefs create reality it's such an important thing that i really believe that not enough people simply understand um it's only something i'm beginning to dabble with i would say for the last six months or so do you have any other self-love practices yeah i have this great thing that i learned from this book it's called code of the extraordinary mind by vishen lakiani he's the founder of mind valley the platform that i use he got this from someone else i've had a iffy view on affirmations. Give you an example. I consider myself very fit. Let's say I wasn't fit. Let's say I was very overweight. And I kept telling myself, I am fit, I am fit, I am fit. There's a little part of my subconscious that's going, no, you're not fat. So you just had a pizza last night. And you know what happens in that moment? You neutralize that belief. You had a good thought and a bad thought. So they neutralize. So one thing I found that's more, even more effective than affirmations is what I call lofty questions. Instead of saying, I am fit, or I have the fit body of a muscular athlete, you say, you put it in the form of a question. Why do I have the fit body of a muscular athlete? Now you see, there's no subconscious resistance when you say that. Why am I so fit? I am not. I am not what? You literally can't answer that anymore. And so now you're moving yourself in that positive direction. And at the same time, like I said earlier, I believe it's not the universe, the sacred law of the universe that I do believe in is not the law of attraction, which many people have heard, but the law of resonance, that the universe doesn't give you what you want, but it gives you who you are. And so by asking these questions, I truly believe that you start to open up opportunities in your life that in which you can then take actions granted those opportunities to ultimately become the person who has the thing that you want. You have to become worthy within and think you're worthy of a fit body before you can have a fit body. So once you become the person, then you can have that thing you want. And so I love those lofty questions. I ask myself them. I probably ask myself 30 different questions every single day after my two meditations every single day, because I literally think it's that important. I'll give you some examples. And this goes with, we have personal beliefs and we have general beliefs. So a personal belief is, I am not ready for a loving relationship because I just broke up with my ex. I would challenge that, reframe it. Why am I so ready for a beautiful and loving relationship? I say that every single morning I've been doing it and afternoon I've been doing it for three or four months now. I feel more ready for a relationship than I felt in my whole life. A general one is a belief that you have about the world. I'll give you another love relationships problem, uh, belief. Love relationships just equal pain and problems. I've thought it my whole life. My, uh, I, my parents had some struggles in their relationship that I, I, I mirrored that was magnified with my ex-girlfriend. And so I asked myself simply, I challenged that. And then I asked myself every single day repeatedly, why do loving relationships bring about the greatest joy on this planet? And oddly enough, there's that literally, I can say with 100% confidence that that is exactly how I view the world. And certain opportunities have come into my life. I'll give you an example of a different one and we don't have to talk about my dating life, I ask myself, why, do such why am I attracting such incredible opportunities as a result of radiating authenticity and making inspiring YouTube content? I believe that me being on your show is one of those opportunities. I believe that I was on another show a couple of weeks ago. I have another podcast coming up uh, in, in a couple of days, and I don't say this to show off, but I say like, and we're even actually in a couple of weeks going to be on the Kelly Clarkson show, which is a huge show. Everyone knows Kelly Clarkson. Um, and I'm saying this, that like this stuff actually works. These opportunities that I couldn't even imagine a couple months ago just started flooding into my life. And now that I say yes to all these opportunities, I'm becoming that person who's able to have those opportunities. I'm becoming more inspiring and speaking better and being more authentic. And so then people want to give me opportunities. But if I just said the affirmations, I have so many opportunities, I have so many opportunities when I didn't, I can't say that the same thing would have happened. Mm. So that's a big one for me. Yeah, no, I completely agree with the affirmation things if you don't believe it. It's like trying to rewrite your limiting beliefs. In a whole, I am not worthy of love and affection is a limiting belief. Let's just yeah. say that. And how you change a limiting belief is you realize you have it, you reward yourself and say, well done, I've realized I've had it. So hopefully next time you remember that you've had it um, and then you change it. 
And this is where people go wrong because they try to change it to something that they totally don't believe. For example, I've given this example before. I used to think I was very stupid. I'm dyslexic, um, proud dyslexic. I love my dyslexia. It comes up with amazing words that I've never even heard of before. But I used to think I was so stupid. And with the added fact that my brothers are really smart, I thought I was stupid. So over the last, I'd say six years, I've changed this belief. But if I went to say, I am amazing, I am clever, I am like the smartest person in the world, am I gonna believe that? No, because I'm not the smartest person in the world. If I say, I am smart, I just have to work a bit harder because of my dyslexia, I am smart, I just have to, you know, put in more effort than other people, I'm going to believe that because it's believable. And I'm more likely not to go back to the old limiting belief. And this is the same thing with affirmations. You do need to say things that you do believe. Because like you said, you have that nagging voice at the back of your head like, "Mm, really, Emily? Are you really sure you're the fittest person? Do you really have a six pack? Because I can't see that six pack there. Like you really believe these things. But yeah, no, affirmations and what you're saying there with the questions as well, um, really inspiring, something that I'll definitely have to look into. It's just reframing these things into a positive light. Um, because if you ask a negative question, you're going to get a negative response. But the great thing with your questions is there are positive questions. You're yeah. going to get a positive response. You're, you're answering in an abundance You're not answering in a lacking way. You're not answering like, I lack these things. It's an abundance coming towards you. What I want to ask you next, which I'm really interested in, is because with all these things, like I say with success, how do you know you're successful if you don't know your own definition of successful? So what I want to ask you is, what is your version of love and acceptance? Because if you don't know what your version of love and acceptance is, how do you know you've reached that? So what is your version of love and acceptance? Yeah, that's a great question. So my version of love and acceptance is unconditional. Now, a lot of people think they know what that means, but here's what I think it means. Unconditional love and acceptance means, well, first I'll say that it means that you need to love someone. This applies to both yourself and to other people, that you need to love someone no matter what, even in their darkest, ugliest moments when their ego is flared, because it's in those moments where even if they won't admit it, like I never did, that's where you need love the most. And that's from yourself. You need to be loving yourself in those moments. It's easy to love yourself or others to love you when you're at your best, when everything's going your way. It's a lot harder to do that when, you don't, when you're in your darker moments. And the second thing I'll say is people often think unconditional love and acceptance means, well, how am I going to grow then? But I love this quote that I heard from a YouTuber that making these two things compatible, acceptance and growth. He says that you are perfect, whole and complete, exactly the way you are right in this moment. Yet, realize that at the same time that this version of you right now that's perfect will be inferior to the version of you in a year from now because you're also growing and learning. And he calls this blissful dissatisfaction. You can sit in a state of bliss and love of yourself while also having a sense of wanting to get to that next level. And I think that's a beautiful way to put it. And I think that, again, applies to yourself. You want yourself to always be better, but you still accept yourself. You don't not accept yourself until you reach a certain level because then it always moves. And that applies to others loving you. I love my brothers for who they are now, but I still want them to be better versions of themselves. And I would hope they want the same for me. So I would say that's my, that would be my definition. Yeah, that really resonates with me. I remember I was on a kind of health journey because whilst I was depressed and anxious, I put on a lot of weight and it was not healthy. And actually I've recently lost two stones, so go me. But I remember during that journey, I used to think I was unlovable, like not worthy of love. But what I realized is... I am worthy of love and my body is beautiful. It's just not where I want it to be. But I'm on the journey so I can still love myself on this journey. You don't have to wait for yourself to get there to love yourself. I can still love myself even though I haven't got the perfect mindset. Like, I still love myself, but I know that in a year's time, I'm going to be like a whole different person. I will still love myself, but I'm going to be different. I totally get that. They're, they're, they're so compatible and people think that they can't be. And I think that's such a flawed mindset. And especially if you can't, if you find it hard to do positive affirmations that you believe, when you find yourself having a negative thought about yourself, finish a sentence with this for now. If you have a negative thought, say for now at the end of it, I am not mm. smart for now. I am not lovable. 
and it's a bit more positive. It's not exactly where you want to be, but it's, it's that possibility. It's that hope. Yeah. And I would even add to that. Maybe even you can say, I don't feel smart now because I truly believe smartness or beauty. These are relative qualities. There's no objective. And so you're saying I'm not smart, but who are you comparing to? You think it's objective. And when you think it's objective, you also think it's permanent. So I love the for now, but also say, I don't feel smart right now. And that's okay. I still love myself regardless, or I'm still worthy regardless. That, I, I just wanted to add to you because I think that was great. No, no, completely. I love that. No, I don't feel it. It doesn't mean just because you don't feel something, it doesn't mean it's permanent. Just right. because you don't think something, it doesn't mean it's permanent. No. I, can feelings like add, I was going to say, feelings add to that temporariness. Feelings are fleeting. They're temporary. So when you say, I feel that way, and you add the fur in this moment now, you're adding to that sense of like, this is a in the moment thing. This is not permanent. You do It's like a double adding. No, love it. Thank you for the addition. What I want to ask you next is what would you say to the person, your old self, who didn't feel lovable and worthy? What would you say to him? Yeah. So to my younger self, who was so deep in his head while presenting this mask of absolute perfection, like he had everything figured out, I wish he would have understood. He is whole and complete and perfect in himself if he if i understood that when i was that age i i've delayed my happiness for 15 years i was so hard on myself in hockey in school i would get the best grade i think i had a 4.7 gpa in high school and i didn't care i never thought it was enough i reached the highest levels of hockey i didn't think it was enough and because of that deep sense of unworthiness that manifested in the appearance of perfection, the competition, the judgment of myself and my brothers. If I just realize, not just realize, because what's funny though, I'll tell you real quick, is that my dad said something when I was 15 years old. He said something that was very along these lines. We were at a public skate, which is basically where there's beginner skaters and you just go on on your skates. And people thought that my brothers and I looked like professionals. And we thought this other kid, Tyler was his name, who played at Harvard, was a professional. And my dad said, you see, these guys think you're professionals. You think that Tyler is a professional. See, it's all relative. So basically what he was saying is it's not objective where we are versus where he is. There's no reason for us to delay our happiness until we reach his level and think that he's perfect and happy because of where he's at. But guess what we did? We laughed in our dad's face and we didn't believe him for a second. We were like, dad, you just don't get it. This Tyler guy is objectively happy. He objectively has everything figured out because he's ahead of us and we don't. The scale's just different, Dad, you just don't understand. But I wish I would have understood that because if I understood and embodied the idea that nothing externally would ever fill me up internally, I would have maybe achieved higher levels of hockey, but more importantly, I would have been happy in the journey, happy in the process of becoming the person I wanna be because life fulfillment, Tony Robbins always says this, is about growth. And so why would I ever wanna stop growing but if I'm never going to stop growing, why would I delay my happiness until I reach a level if I'm always going to keep moving? That's a recipe for the hedonic treadmill of constant dissatisfaction for the rest of my life. And that was the majority of my childhood. It was spent in here. This inner voice loves to project itself into the future. And I just listened to that voice. And I wish I would have known some of these things that I knew now. And when I have kids, I will be teaching them all of this stuff as early as possible so they can get past some of these things earlier. No, no, I agree. And I agree with teaching your kids as well. But I think without, like you can learn from people's lessons and you can learn from people's mistakes, um, but people do need to go through their own problems. People need to go through that. You needed to go through that to be where you are now. You needed to go through that to be talking to me right now. You needed to go through that to start your YouTube channel. And if you didn't go through that, you'd have a totally different life. And that's why I'm so grateful for all my trauma. My dad passed away when I was 12, but it's hard to say for anything, but I'm grateful. Like, I wish he was still here, but I'm grateful for what I've learned. I'm grateful that I'm here because if that didn't happen, I wouldn't be here. So it's been grateful for all these hard times and trauma and everything like that. Yeah, I'm, I'm very sorry to hear that, but that's also so, so, so empowering to hear. I can't imagine how you must have felt in that moment. And the funny thing is about, in retrospect, years later, sometimes decades later, it's so much easier to look back and see the lessons and see that it happened for a reason. But in the moment, 
when I was dropping that fraternity in that low, there was no way I could see why this happened. Now I look back, I'll give the girl and those guys a hug. I'm so happy it happened. And that's where I think there's an element of faith that has to come in, that this happens for a greater reason because you literally can't see it in that moment. And if you don't have that though, not all suffering transforms. There's people that get destroyed by suffering. There's two paths that suffering takes you, transformation or destruction. The choice is yours if you can exhibit faith, let it feel that fully, use it as to confront yourself and realize certain things that need to change or certain ways you wanna be, and you can come out of that, look back and say this happened for a reason. Or you can escape that pain through drugs, other addictions, and you can look back and you'll be the exact same person you were. You'll, those people, I'll give you a quick example. My mom, her dad was murdered at the age of seven. Murdered, like in her own house. Horrible, horrible, horrible. She, her mom was a drug addict. Her mom was a total drug addict, substance abuser, treated her four daughters horribly. But guess what? My mom is the most incredible, saint-like mom. She works so hard, she has the biggest heart because she made a decision in that moment of suffering of her childhood to never let anyone suffer like she did. She let that suffering transform her. Well, I'll say, looking back, my mom could say, that happened for a reason. That was meant to happen. Her two sisters that are in jail currently, because they let the suffering destroy them through drugs and alcohol and other things, they're not gonna look back and say that same thing. But there's, there's just such a difference between suffering. And I think you can give suffering an inherent meaning by having the decision to let it transform you. It's the hardest path in that moment to climb out of it, but it's the most worthwhile one. Yeah, I saw a quote on Facebook where it says, um, two brothers, two twins, um, their dad's an alcoholic. One of them is an alcoholic and the person asks him why. And he says, because my dad was, that's all I ever knew. And the second brother said, they said, why don't you drink? And he said, because my dad did. And I didn't want to be anything like it. It's your perspective. It's how you take your traumas and move on from it. You can go through trauma and go through both paths. I went yeah. through the destruction route to get to the thriving. I had to like survive to fry. It's possible for anyone. And I so agree with, um, and it's so cliche, but even when my dad died, everything happens for a reason. When my cousin committed suicide, everything happens for a reason. But it's so hard to say, but there is a reason. Or if you believe there's a reason, you're going to find a reason. There might not necessarily be a reason. There's, there's like people die and it's horrible. and You don't want to think there's a reason, but there can be a reason if you look for it. There can be growth. And like you said, in retrospect, you can look back and say, I have to go through that to be able to be here. You yes. can't do that while you're in the moment. Um, but you have to wait that five years, that 10 years to be able to look back and connect the dots. Exactly. So yeah, I would say to my younger self who didn't feel worthy, um, I don't know if I'd say it, but I know I've learned it that to just loving yourself is a skill like learning to love yourself is a skill because you're not born or you're taught to not love yourself doesn't mean that you can't love yourself again but if you realize that everything in life really is just a skill and you learn how to do these things like you learn how to walk you learn how to talk you learn how to speak you learn how to love yourself and um, but just because it's not taught in schools doesn't mean you can't self-teach yourself and when you learn to love yourself so many things will get better and when you love yourself, you have more love to give. When you yeah. love yourself, you are such a better person, not for yourself, but for your family, your friends, the people you meet, strangers, and everything like that. I, I totally agree with that. I, I love that. And I think at the process, I like to call it a rediscovery or re-falling love in, in love with yourself because I do believe like you, I do believe at one point in our lives, we do love ourselves when we're very little. We all think we're worthy of love and attention. Just watch the way babies act. They feel that way something causes us to not feel that way. And we have to go through a process. I like to call it rediscovering your, your inner child, healing that inner child that's always within you. When you tap into that, that wholeness, that completeness, it radiates out and like you said, it has such an amazing impact beyond what you could ever see when you felt unworthy on everyone around you. It touches them on such a deep level and it's, it's such a beautiful thing. I would love to give my younger self that advice too, that it's very good. It's a skill. It's not something you're born with it. You lose it. You can get it back. It's great, great advice. And also what I would say to someone struggling right now, and it's similar along the lines to your unconditional love, but what your unconditional love to me is compassion. Have yeah. compassion in your hard times as well as your good times. Have compassion for not only other people, but mainly yourself. If you're struggling right now, have compassion don't judge yourself. 
know that it's okay to struggle. Like you're not broken. You don't need to be fixed. You just need to work on your problems and everyone in their own way. Let's be honest. We're all a little broken in some way, but we're not like completely snapped in half. We've just got little chips, but you know what? The best cups and tea sauces and whatever have chips on them because they're more unique and the more chips you have, the more unique you are, the more you can sympathize with other people, empathize and everything like that, all the good stuff. So embrace your uniqueness, embrace your struggles and have compassion. I I love that. To sum it up, just the perfection is in the imperfection. When we stop thinking perfect means this ideal standard that we can never live up to flawless, but perfection is imperfect. Is the imperfection and the beauty is in our flaws. And that's what makes us human. That's what makes us who we are. Ex- being able to embody that, which is not as easy to do as to understand that, man, something changes in you and it affects everyone around you. Be perfectly imperfect. Yes. I say. Um, have you got any last words on the subject of not feeling worthy of love and acceptance and attention? What I'll say is I've been there it's a continual process I'll still come back to. What I didn't believe for so long that you can actually go within and change some of these things. Like you said, Emily, love, self-love is a trainable skill. Through habit and through mindset, you can actually reprogram these things and you can change everything around you by simply going within. So it's time to stop looking to the outside world, to stop looking to what society says, to stop saying so busy all the time capitalism in american society especially keeps us going and going and going for their profit and it's really hard because you have to i've had to fight against the system i felt like for so many years now to truly be myself to make the societal mistake of truly being myself in every moment but that's it's such a worthwhile journey And it does get easier, I promise. It may feel like the hardest thing in the world to do. Change is inherently painful because it's not easy, it's uncomfortable. But I promise you'll look back, you'll look back on your life and you'll say that was the most worthwhile journey. And what I, the last thing I'll say is I believe that pain is life, that there's, but you can choose what type of pain you want. The pain on the road to success or the pain of being haunted with regret, of getting to your deathbed and saying you never truly lived. And I'd much rather suffer the pain right now of constantly growing and evolving myself and fighting against society than getting to the end of my life. Because we have one short life. Life goes fast. That's something I've realized. And we're all gonna die one day, whether we like it or not. And what that should do is not make you afraid, but it should wake you up to being the best you in every single moment. And this is the most worthwhile journey I've ever been on. And I would encourage everyone to do the same. One last thing to add towards your change. There's this great quote that says, change is hard in the beginning, messy in the middle and beautiful in the end. Like change, you've got to get uncomfortable to see the beauty. So yeah, Yeah. I just want to thank everyone for watching this episode and especially you Sabin for being here as a guest. If you have enjoyed this video, please make sure you give it a like, let us know in the comments, subscribe and hit that bell button so you never miss an episode of The Limitless Show. I will see you next week with another episode and thank you so much for watching and Sabin, I appreciate you. Thank you so much, Emily. It's been uh, such an amazing conversation. I really enjoyed it.